where you're just absolutely disappointed with your family members. And when it comes to being slain in the spirit and family members, Christians who also hold to this belief, it's very disappointing. Why? Because without question, it is unbiblical. When we talk about unbiblical, again, we see these this definition here. You take the un, the prefix, the word Bible, the suffix, all means relating to or containing. That literally means it's unbiblical. So if it's not found in the Bible, well, then it's, de it's the very definition of being unbiblical. Recently, I made a, a short video outlining or describing or even asking for someone to give any sort of biblical defense for these things that are completely unbiblical. And so there was one particular person who decided to give a comment and say that what, the, what they were saying is unbiblical. And I want to even look at their actual scriptures they bring up because they believe that there are scriptures that, are, that make or state that being slain in the spirit is biblical for example this person keep up to i'm not sure who this person is says uh revelation 1 17 is, a, is an example uh acts 9 4 daniel 8 and 10 and 9 i suppose ezekiel 1 28 we'll look at john 18 5 someone else chimes in as well i'm not sure if they even add even more scriptures and i won't go through all of them but what we're going to do is we're going to look at some of these scriptures and you're going to find out that none of these are actual definitions uh, or examples of being slain in the spirit. What is slain in the spirit? You all have seen the examples of it time and time again. Matter of fact, what you've seen is what someone tries to put on us as this is a move of the spirit. What you'll notice though, when you look in the Bible, when the, when, and obviously if God moves and someone wants to be so overcome, that can happen. Can God make a person fall to their knees and so forth? Well, sure. That's, a, that's not what we're talking about. What we're talking about is what we're seeing today in these churches. When you compare what you see today in today's churches and these so-called men and women of God who are being slain in the spirit, compare actual encounters of people in the Bible with God and notice their lives, not at that moment, but notice them going forward. Look at Paul's life. Look at Peter's life. Look at John's life. Look at all of the, the uh, prophets. Look at the apostles' life. Look at how the people of God, when they had a true encounter with the Lord, how they were. Matter of fact, notice that in, in comparison to the people today, they're constantly going back for the same thing to be filled again, to be slain again, all of that only to be followed up with bad or horrendous doctrine. And we're going to notice something when you ask for the people that are the, the folks they turn to, the doctors, those with some sort of scholarship, those who are leading larger ministries to give a defense for this, they can't find scriptures. But again, let's go ahead and start looking at some of these scriptures and let's just see. Let's start with, you know what? Let's start in John 18, 5. Here's one that they bring up on us that says this is a person, an example of someone being slain in the spirit. So let's go there. John 18, 5. And says, they answered him. This is when they come to see Jesus. They answered him, Jesus, the Nazarene. He said to them, I am he. And Judas also who was betraying him was standing with them. So when he said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Therefore, he said again to them, who do you seek? So here's an example where he speaks and they fell back. They draw back to the ground. And did all of them fall? I'll say so. Maybe so. Let's go with that. They all fell to the ground. Is that them being slain in the spirit? Well, how could it be? This is this is when it, it becomes comical and just not even for this person to be taken serious. How is this an example of them being slain in the spirit? Remember, if they're going to be slain in the spirit, and I understand the word slain is not there, but meaning they were so overcome by the spirit, they were in the spirit. and they fell. These people didn't receive the Holy Spirit. These are not Christians. These are not people. Now, if you're wanting to say that these folks, uh, this is what happens when sinners meet meet the Lord. OK, is that what you're ascribing to, to be a sinner and have this, this sort of encounter? These are not Christians. That, so you couldn't point to this on just the basis of the fact that these are not Christians Two. They didn't receive the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit didn't enter them. The Lord spoke. They fell back. Do I believe the power of God can so overcome a person to knock them down? An enemy of God could blind them, can kill them, can burn. 
however God wants to do so. Yes, but this is clearly not an example. This is not what happens at some of these churches. Or are we are we to say, and maybe it's true, maybe what we're seeing, if if what's happening in churches is what you see in John 18, well, that means that all of you people that are falling out, if you're going to use this passage, yeah, you're not saved. So you won't you don't want to use that passage. So let's go to the next passage that he brings up. He brings up, and I'm, this is not in any particular order, but he brings up Acts 9, 4. Let's go to Acts 9, 4. And this is Paul. Paul um, hearing from meeting the Lord Jesus on, on Damascus. Let's start in verse 3. As he was traveling, it happened that he was approaching Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him, and he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get up and enter the city. Now, here's the question. Was this an example of Paul being slain in the spirit. Well, first of all, something else that we know that needs to be understood here. Saul, Paul, one is his Jewish name, one is a Roman name. But the question is this, did Paul have the Holy Spirit at this moment? Two, was he slain? In this case, this is him falling to the ground. This is him on his own. This is an uh, uh, heiress active participle. It's not middle. Uh, and so, it seems to indicate that this is him doing it to himself. This seems to be him falling, and in this case, probably falling forward, bowing, because one, Paul is conscious. Paul knows what's going on. He's responding back. The Lord is responding to him, and then the Lord tells him to get up, meaning that he could get up. So it, why would the Lord tell him to get up if he knocked him down? Maybe the Lord would bring him up. I don't know, but one thing we do know for sure is that in this case, Paul did not receive the Holy Spirit. How do we know? Because later on in Acts, we see him actually receiving the Holy Spirit. So again, this could not be an example of someone being slain in the Spirit because they did they weren't in the Spirit. Here we have just the Lord show up and the encounter. Paul humbles himself and bows down because when you're in the presence of God and you know it's the presence of God, well, then you would act accordingly. You would bow yourself over. You would reverence who it is that you're standing before. And th and also, this is why Paul never loses conscience. Paul is uh, within his full faculties. He understands what's going on and he speaks and he responds to the Lord and the Lord responds to him and tells him to get up. Why? Because Paul was in control of himself and could get up. And again, all of this is happening with him not having received the Holy Spirit. Now, the next passage I want to go to is Revelation 1.17. This is John. He is speaking on the Isle of Patmos. And look what he says. He says, when I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man. And he placed his right hand on me saying, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. Now, why is this not an example? Why is this a bad example? Matter of fact, it's not an example. John is not slain in the spirit. John is in the spirit. Notice what he says, though. He says, when I saw him, I fell at his feet. Like this word host in the Greek host or the English like, this is what I was like. I was I fell down like a dead man. Now, but here's the difference. He did so, he does so on his own, and he understands what's happening. He's in full control, full understanding of what's happening. He's not slain, he's not out. The Lord is speaking to him. This is what you do when you have a legitimate encounter, uh, seems to be. Uh, in this case, having a legitimate encounter, he on his own seems to be, and there's that same word there where he falls, where this is you doing it to yourself. You are bowing over and he's in complete control. He's understanding. Now, are we going to take that every time that someone has an encounter with the Lord, there, there's a vision uh, and the person goes to their knees or bows over that that's being slain in the spirit? Because that would also, that would mean that praying would be being slain in the spirit. Anytime someone is praying, and the presence of the Lord shows up, well, that person's that person is slain in the spirit. No, this is what you do. Also, notice what's missing from here. We don't see the person who is a believer having then uh, the encounter of the spirit. Because remember, when we talk about someone being slain in the spirit, we're talking about someone who's a Christian, who apparently has the Lord, who has, the, who has placed their faith in Christ, and then an overcoming of the Holy Spirit comes upon them. We don't see this happening here. We see an encounter. We see him having a vision. We see him having uh, being spoken to by the Lord, not the Holy Spirit. Come, and now, now am, I, am I going against the Trinity? No. What I'm saying is that in this phenomenon that they describe to us, this is a Christian who has the Lord living in their heart, and then the Holy Spirit comes upon them. That's not what's happening here in John. 
I mean, in, in Revelation. And so again, another bad example, as a matter of fact, not an example of someone being slain in the spirit. And then we go to the Old Testament. Let's look at, a matter of fact, before we go to the Old Testament, let's go to Matthew 28. This is another example. Now, this is a goofy example. This is Matthew 28, 4 that's been brought up. Let's start in verse 3. He says, uh, and at his appearing uh, was like lightning and his clothing was as white as snow. The guard shook for fear of him and became like dead men. Again, that, that same term became, and there's the word host and then dead, so it became like dead men. Well, this is at the appearing of an angel. So now are we saying not only can you be slain in the spirit, but you can also be slain in the angel. This is not the Holy Spirit. This is an angel that's appeared before them. And again, the same thing that's happening here that we see in other cases where they are just showing some reverence. They are bowing over. They are in reverence and they become like dead men, not able to move. Um, but notice what's happening. Their understanding is there. They can understand. They can respond back and so forth. I don't know why a person would even refer to this one because clearly this is not God. But if you want to make something fit, you'll do anything and everything that you can to make a particular passage fit. So now let's go to the Old Testament. Let's go to two passages in Daniel. Daniel 8, verse 17. So he came near to where I was standing and where, uh, I'm sorry, when he came, I was frightened and fell on my face. But he said, son of man, understand that the vision pertains to the time of the end. So now here's Daniel falling. Now, one, Daniel's bowing over on his own. He's praying, but who shows up? Was it God? No. Holy Spirit? No. Jesus? No. It's an angel. And so Daniel is speaking to um, an angel. He has this vision and an angel is before him. So again, is, is Daniel also being slain in the angel? And then if we go to Daniel 10, 8, uh, so I was left alone and I saw a great vision, yet no strength was left in me. Okay, that doesn't mean that you're slain in the spirit. No strength was left in me for my natural color turned to a deathly parlor and I retained no strength. But I heard the sound of his word. And as soon as I heard the sound of his word, I fell into a deep sleep on my face with my face to the ground. Then behold, a hand touched me and set me trembling on my hands and knees. And he said to me, O Daniel, man of high esteem. Now, how was Daniel on the ground? That's important. Daniel is on his what? As the Bible says, on his hands and knees. That's forward. He is voluntarily uh, not prostrate himself, but on his bowing in honor. Uh, and so, again, is this slain in the spirit? No, he's not slain in the spirit. He, as a matter of fact, he's not in the spirit. The spirit didn't come upon him. He is in a vision, though. He is seeing. And if you want to say that, that, that he's in a that he's in the spirit, that's fine. He's not slain in the spirit. Now, is anyone denying the fact that you could actually, uh, especially in the Bible, someone have a vision, be in the spirit, and so forth? No. We're saying this phenomenon that, that we're seeing people being knocked over, someone touched them on the head, someone waving their hand, someone swiping their feet, doing all these different things to cause people to fall. Remember, one of the attributes, one of the one of the characteristics, one of the traits of the Holy Spirit, or we say the fruit of the Spirit is self-control. Going to Ezekiel 3, look at this one. So I got up and went out into the plain, and behold, the glory of the Lord was standing there like the glory which I saw by the river of, of Shebar, and I fell on my face. So again, falling forward, and this is him doing so on his own, the Spirit then entered me and made me stand up on my feet. Wait a minute. Hold on. This is different now. So the person before the Spirit hits them, they fall over. Ezekiel falls over on his face going forward because so this is voluntarily him doing so. And then the spirit entered him and then was got up. So this person wasn't slain in the spirit. This person was stood up in the spirit. This person was brought up in the spirit. They fell over on their own. And I should say fell over. They fell forward, got to the ground on their own, and the spirit entered them and they stood up. So again, the opposite of what we see happening again, because I believe, as I just said, when the Holy Spirit is in a person, that person has self-control. Now, the interesting thing is when you turn to the the best and brightest of these people that are, that ascribe to this, uh, the the Sam Storms of the world, the the Dr. Michael Brown, the cricket, they, they're not giving scriptures. As a matter of fact, listen to Dr. Michael Brown in his defense of being slain in the spirit. There is no, he notice what he doesn't give. He does not give a biblical defense of being slain in the spirit. During the Great Awakening, Jonathan Edwards, the great philosopher and theologian in the early 1700s, mid 1700s in America, he made the comment, we ought not to limit God where he hath not limited himself. 
In other words, there are things that are unbiblical. They are contrary to the Word. They are sinful. They are to be rejected. There are other things that are extra-biblical. They are simply not spoken of in the Word. Now, this is why this is foolish. One, because rather than point to a passage to make the point, you point to a person who gives a statement that you can agree with, that you like. And we shouldn't reject the things that are just because they're not merely attested to in the scriptures. Well, the scripture doesn't say that I shouldn't punch my dog in the face. Should I? No, I should not. But the Bible doesn't say I should not. This is how this is silly. If we're going to live by the scriptures, let's live by the scriptures. Let's live by the words that literally proceed from the spirit himself rather than making up things. Now, notice what he also says in terms of why we can kind of listen to this because of the tradition of the church now. The word, they are not recorded in Scripture, and Scripture does not give us specific guidelines. For example, if someone is shaking, can we evaluate, is that the Spirit or not, based on how they shake? If someone is crying, can we evaluate, is that the Spirit or not, based on the tears? Uh, is the heart beating? These are some of the things Edwards talked about, that the Bible doesn't give us these guidelines. When the heart beats like this, it's the Spirit. Like this, it's not the Spirit. No, the things that are not explicitly recorded in Scripture and that do not violate guidelines of Scripture must be judged by the overall fruit. It's the same with, quote, being slain in the Spirit. You say, well, hang on. There's always a precedent in church history. Well, there's been a precedent for many, many years now that this has happened when people are prayed for. Now, here's what he's saying. Because there's a precedent now, lately in, in church history, recent church history, of people being slain in the Spirit, falling on and so forth, well, then we can go with that. No, we can't. It's a modern, it's a new phenomenon that is literally, I wouldn't say literally less than 100 years old, but it's somewhere about 100 years old uh, of this just occurring more and more and more. You've got more folks being slain in the Spirit than we did then in the Bible. And the reason why I say more than then, because we have zero have of it happening in the Bible, but it's now happening now. And because it's happening now, we can take that as proof positive that that's the spirit. Well, wait a second. No, we cannot. Again, if you cannot give us a scripture, then as, what did I say? It is literally the definition of unbiblical. If the doctrine or belief of anything is not found in the Bible, then by definition is unbiblical. Being slain in the spirit is unbiblical biblical and then you get because it's unbiblical you got people that are searching for examples for rationale to say why it is biblical because it's what they practice now what about those who reject the manifestation because it is extra biblical or not found in scripture as they would say here i have to point out something just because you can't find an entire doctrine encapsulated in a specific chapter and verse of the Bible, does it mean that it isn't biblical? It absolutely does mean it's, it's not biblical. It, that, it's a silly statement. And the reason why you, you keep this, you, the reason why you want to promote this, because it works in your favor. You, have, you do not want to be seen as being wrong uh, and you built your ministry off of this, off of these spiritual phenomenons, these spiritual phenomena that are not found in the Bible, what he just said is unbiblical. He tends to be unbiblical. And I'm not trying to be mean, but I'm just trying to be as biblical as possible. If I cannot find it in the scriptures, well, then why would I go with it? If I can't find examples of it, which is why he and Dr. Brown and many others said, well, yeah, it's not in the scriptures, but so what? Well, that that's, that's pretty important to note that it's not in the scriptures, but we should do it anyway. Do it anyway. Do as I say uh, that is the preacher, not as the Bible says. And that's a dangerous precedent that we're setting. And we're seeing that more and more to where we're going outside of the Bible, looking for extra biblical reasons to do something that is not biblical. And so guys, since there's no scripture, if these are the best scriptures they can come up with to show that slain in the spirit is biblical, which it's not. And even if the, the better scholars, the better teachers, the more known or noted ones, I will even agree that, yes, there is none. Well, then maybe you should also do the same thing, reject it. Because, again, if you need to have this to, to validate your, your salvation, then maybe you don't have it. If the word of God isn't enough for you, if the word of God doesn't move you, if it's not what you live by, then maybe you're just not a Christian. Or it could be, hopefully, it's just that you're not a very good one. You're not a very mature Christian. But learn to be like babies who desire the pure milk desire the word of God in the same way. Don't live off milk though. 
grow and, and learn to live off meat, the weight of your things. Stop. We should get past the, the basic things. And then as we grow in the grace and the knowledge, remember these scriptures were given to us by the Holy Spirit. And if they're not enough for you, then maybe you're saying that, God, you're not enough. Remember what Satan is always wanting to do. Take the word, twist the word, did the same thing with Eve in the garden. Try to do the same thing with Jesus. But again, this is Jesus. And he's going to do the same thing with us. Use the scriptures, go by the scriptures, and don't let anything else supplant the importance of the scriptures, not even experience or emotions. Amen. Amen.